Next, former National Intelligence Director James Clapper. He spoke about his career in the intelligence community and shared his views on current intelligence issues, including evolving technology and social media, terrorism, North Korea, Russia, and Iran. The George Washington University hosted this 90-minute event. Welcome to the Elliott School and to this beautiful uh, conference venue that we have available to us this evening. My name is Ambassador Laura Holgate. I am a distinguished visitor at the Institute for International Science and Technology Policy here at the Elliott School. Uh, emphasis on the visitor part. I'm not here very often, but it's a super treat to be here this evening uh, to have a chance to, to introduce uh, a, a true hero uh, from our, our national uh, security community. And you've all seen his, his biography and the title for this evening's talk of, of a career a discussion on an intelligence career. And it's hard to imagine anyone uh, more uh, suited to the topic of a career in intelligence than uh, Mr. James Clapper. And uh, it's a great, a great treat to have him here this evening. Um, as you can see from his uh, background, uh, he's had over five years of experience in the intelligence community in the military side, on the civilian side, inside and outside government, and overseas as well. And maybe it's not listed in his bio, but maybe someone can ask him a question to tell you about his 2014 visit to North Korea uh, to rescue a couple of Americans uh, who got caught up there. Um, I first met Mr. Clapper in the 1990s when I was a baby bureaucrat in the Pentagon, and he was head of Defense Intelligence Agency. And I was, I confess, a, a little bit scared of him when I first encountered him, but my boss, Ash Carter, and the rest of the Pentagon uh, civilian leadership held him in such high regard and respect um, that uh, we, we were all uh, grateful to have him part of the team. Most recently, uh, I logged many hours uh, with Mr. Clapper in the White House Situation Room discussing North Korea, Ebola outbreaks, Syria chemical weapons, and the whole gamut of national security issues. The, uh, these were in the format of the Principals Committee uh, meeting uh, ch chaired by Ambassador Susan Rice, and I was on the back bench. He was, of course, at the table. And as some of you know, because uh, I know you do some role playing here, uh, all of the every uh, Principals Committee meeting begins with an intelligence update. And so it was almost like a ritual prayer. Uh, Mr. Can Mr. Clapper would uh, intone uh, the latest update on whatever hard problem uh, that was on the sit room table that day. Uh, it has been my pleasure over my entire career to work with incredibly talented members of the intelligence community, and in particular uh, in my last tour at the White House to, to work with people who work directly with Mr. Clapper. Um, and I know I speak for not only myself, but for legions of intelligence professionals in noting the integrity and humanity uh, with which he has led uh, the intelligence community from his various roles. And he truly personifies the term servant leader. And so, sir, it's a, a special honor to, to be able to introduce you tonight. The other uh, thing that, that shows the humility of that is uh, I, I did a little bit of surveying some of his um, former teammates, and who said a favorite saying of his is that uh, you know their their job was to be down there in the engine room shoveling coal, uh, Intel coal. And so I am sure uh, that we will have more than coal uh, from the conversation that he offers us today. And uh, so it is uh, my distinct honor to invite Mr. James Clapper to, to the podium. Thank you very much. Well, thank, thanks very much. Uh, it's great to, great to be here. And uh, at first, I think I should uh, pay tribute both to uh, Laura, Dr. Holgate, and as well, uh, the gentleman sitting to uh, Wright, who was, I think, I'm sure is known to many of you, uh, Chris Kojum. Uh, Chris and I worked together when uh, Chris served with great distinction as the uh, chairman of what's called the National Intelligence Council. And uh, if any of you are looking for uh, uh, role models for public service, you only need to look right here uh, at, at uh, Laura and Chris. Um, what I thought I'd do tonight is uh, 
and I think, you know, not, I'm going to try not to t talk too long because uh, what I'm really interested in is, uh, you know, dialogue and questions and, uh, and discussion. So I thought I'd talk about 20 minutes about uh, of, of some ruminations on the profession of intelligence. <clears throat> um, I do that by way of a commercial. I'm writing a book and uh, <laughs> reflecting on the uh, 50 plus years or so uh, I spent in uh, professional intelligence. And so for the first time in a long time, I had some, you know, some time for contemplation. And so <clears throat> well, I thought I'd share some of those ruminations with you. Uh, and uh, hopefully, uh, if you're not already interested in but at least consider uh, public service, national security, and, and I think more specifically, uh, I'm here to recruit for intelligence. Um, and in doing so, just a, a couple of lessons I learned along the way. And uh, uh, again, I'll just touch on some of these things and we can talk more about them in the, in the Q&A period. My father was an Army intelligence officer. He served in World War II, uh, specifically uh, signal intelligence. Uh, you know, collecting and enemy communications and breaking codes and that sort of thing. And he served during World War II and uh, during the Korean War. And then, coincidentally, is quite by accident, he and I served together in Vietnam uh, in 1965 and 66. Um, so, in some ways, I probably inherited the intelligence gene from him. In fact, first time in my life, I knew I was going to be an intelligence officer. I was about uh, 12 years old. It was uh, 1953. And typically, military families, when you're moving from duty station to duty station, you move a lot in the military, the parents would drop the kids at the grandparents and go on to the next place, find a place to live, get the house set up, and then come back and retrieve the kids from the grandparents. You just you know, stay out of the way. So in the summer of 1953, we had just returned from Japan, uh, Hokkaido, the northernmost island of Japan, and we're on our way to Fort Devens, Massachusetts. And so my parents dropped my sister and me off at my grandparents in Philadelphia. And of course, you know, grandkids love, and I'm going through this now because I have four grandkids, you know, you spoil them. And the big thing was I could stay up as late as I wanted to watch television. Now, back in the day, back in 1953, television was still a novelty, not like it is now. So anyway, one of my favorite shows on Friday night was the Schmidt's Beer Mystery Hour. And they used to show these old Charlie Chan movies. I loved them, you know, from the 30s. And so after the one night, one Friday, uh, first, first Friday I was there, as a matter of fact, uh, <clears throat> I decided it was about 12.30 in the morning I, go, I was going to surf. Now, for all of you in this room, in those days when you surfed, you had to actually go up to the TV and turn the dial. I know that's a completely foreign concept, but that's the way it worked. So I was, and you only had uh, like 13 channels, that's all. Black and white, big, huge television with vacuum tubes and nothing like you have, you know, the flat screens and all that. Anyway, so I'm turning the dial between channel four and five, and about halfway between those two channels, I heard talking. Well, that's odd. So I, ho I just held the, t the TV selector right there, halfway between channel four and five, and I held it for about 15 minutes, and I figured out it was the Philadelphia uh, Police Department dispatcher. <laughs> and it was really interesting to me because there's all kinds of mayhem going on <laughs> in the city of Philadelphia, you know. And it was really interesting. So <clears throat> after a while, I got tiresome, tiring, holding that, TV knob, so I switched it to make sure I could get it back, and then I ran out of the kitchen and got some toothpicks and stuck them in the, the selector dial so it would stay on that one position. So I guess I hacked my grandparents' black and white TV set. <laughs> so anyway, I started listening. And it was just interesting. So I stayed up to oh, 2.30 or 3 in the morning, and so the next night, I was gonna do the same thing. So I got a, a map of the city of Philadelphia. And so I started plotting the police calls, you know, where, where they would dispatch cruisers and all this sort of thing. And, uh, and it didn't take too long. I'm doing this night after night, bear in mind. I could figure out, you know, where the high crime areas were in Philadelphia and all this sort of thing. And then, you know, the police use these 10 codes, like 10-4 and 10-6, and they have certain meanings. So I got a bunch of 3 by 5 cards. 
And I started writing these down, and when I you know, kind of started figuring them out, because you could figure out the context, and they'd compromise them and say what they really were. Then I f <coughs> figured out that the, they, had, uh, they had a call sign allocation system where police cruisers would, in each district would have a unique set of call signs that they would call the, the cruiser, whoever was riding in it. And then I also found out that the uh, police officers and the greater lieutenant and above all had their own personal call signs. So I had these card files set up, you know, and pretty soon just by the way they dispatched uh, police cruisers, I figured out what the police district boundaries were in the city of Philadelphia. So after about three weeks of this, I had a pretty good idea how the Philadelphia Police Department works. <laughs> now, I didn't really know what I was doing, it just seemed a cool thing to do. So my dad, who spent his life in the signal intelligence business, he, he and my mom come back, they pick up my sister and me, so my dad says, well, hey, you know, what have you been doing? So I whip out my map <laughs> with, with the police districts on it and the high crime areas. I whip out my, I guess you'd call it metadata today, but my three by five cards. And I'll never, you know, 65 years ago, I still remember the expression on my dad's face. My God, I've raised my own replacement. <laughs> Now, I tell that story, unfortunately, for humor, but also to make a serious point, because it does illustrate, even though I didn't know what I was doing, it does illustrate the, the nature of the work in intelligence, where you're figuring out a problem where you don't know all the facts. You have to draw inferences. You have to corroborate your hypothesis, test your theory, and then at some point in time, you'll come up with, you know, that's, that's a fact. That's a fact I can go with. And that's kind of what I did, even though I didn't know. But anyway, that's when I knew I was going to be in intelligence. But anyway, fast forward, I enlisted the Marine Corps Reserve in 1961, <clears throat> moved to the Air Force, was commissioned. Uh, I went to the University of Maryland, finished up there in 1963, and was commissioned uh, a second lieutenant in, in, the, in the Air Force. I did 32 years. In the Air Force, uh, moved the, we moved 23 times in that 32 years. And my last job in active duty was, as Laura indicated, I was director of DIA for four years, and I retired in 1995. I was out of the government for six years, but still working for the government. I uh, did the Cobalt Towers investigation uh, in 1996, which is when I really got religion about terrorism. We can talk about that if you want. Uh, a Gilmore Commission, a commission headed by former Governor uh, Jim Gilmore of Virginia on uh, weapons of mass destruction, served on the NSA, the National Security Agency Advisory Board for four years, and I taught intelligence uh, at the graduate level. I came back in 2001, specifically two days after 9-11, as director of what was then called the National Imagery and Mapping Agency, which is now uh, director of uh, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Did that for almost five years was out for a couple months, and uh, Bob Gates, who was then Secretary of Defense, who had been the DCI, the Director of Central Intelligence, when I was DIA Director, asked me to come back and uh, be the Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence, which oversees all intelligence and just DOD. And the deal was only 19 months, and then he got held over. He asked me to stay on, so 19 months turned into three and a half years. And then I thought I was done, and uh, I was just dragooned one more time into uh, serving as DNI. I did that for six and a half years. And I stopped that on January 20th. And I can tell you, it is a great time to be a former. <laughs> um, went to Vietnam in 1960. That was my war, Southeast Asia. I did two tours there, 65 and 66. I don't know how many of you may have seen at least some of the uh, series. I think it's on PBS. Uh, by Ken Burns on Vietnam, and it is very well done. And having lived through that era, both the war itself and the aftermath of it, which was a very, very traumatic time for this country. So I, I really resonate with that series because I think uh, it captured not only uh, the substance of facts, but the, the atmosphere uh, of it as well. For me, personally, that was absolutely the worst year of my life, uh, both personally and uh, professionally. I hated the war. I became very disillusioned about it. I briefed for a time uh, General Westmoreland, who was the commander there, and then I really got disillusioned. 
So I was all, all ready to get out of the Air Force uh, as soon as I could after my tour was up, came about this close. And some, for some reason, somebody sort of plucked me out of anonymity and mentored me. Um, there was a couple of general officers that uh, you know, picked me out of uh, the crowd as for some reason. And that had a huge, huge impact on my life and, and, and my career. I just mentioned that because uh, to, to emphasize the importance of mentoring. So, well, I don't have anybody to mentor. Well, what you, I would commend to you and what I'd always tell people, young people in our agencies, that, uh, that if you see somebody that you think would be an appealing role, uh, who is a role model for you, ask them to mentor you. Don't wait to be asked. And there will no thinking senior I don't care what, what the capacity will, will turn you down because they're, they're going to be so flattered and honored that you asked. And that's a way to help yourself advance your career wherever, uh, wherever you go. And I just mentioned that very briefly because a huge impact had on me. Um, then uh, I was back in uh, actually Texas for a while, went back for a volunteer to go back for a second tour, which in contrast to the first one was very, very rewarding. Uh, I was uh, flying uh, reconnaissance missions uh, on the back end of some uh, old rickety uh, C-47s from World War II and uh, commanded a SIGINT detachment and flew about uh, 73 combat support missions. Uh, my second tour was a, was a great tour. Um, so, um, after my uh, second tour in Southeast Asia, which ended in June of 1971, I was by the same, an, another mentor who planted me in the heady environs of the front office of the National Security Agency at Fort Meade, Maryland. So I was, at this point, a young captain. I had about eight years service, and, this was, and I was working directly for turned out to be two three-star officers, two three-star directors. Uh, they're both dead now, so I can talk about them. And I bring this up because uh, of the contrasting styles in their leadership. Uh, I served for the last year working for uh, Admiral, uh, then Vice Admiral Noel Geiler, who went, got his four-star, went on to be the Pacific Command, combatant commander. And then he was followed by uh, Air Force uh, three-star general as director of NSA, who was only there a year, then he got his four-star and went on to another assignment in the Air Force. I bring this up just to mention uh, the two uh, contrasting leadership styles, and I recount this uh, in the book, because Admiral Geiler was a very uh, demanding uh, uh, boss, very smart, uh, but he was extreme, and it was extremely hard on people. And what I watched happen here you know, went from my, man, my vantage as military assistant, which meant I you know, kept his calendar and tracked his papers and all that sort of thing. So I had a lot of opportunity to observe. And what I noticed is that that style of leadership is effective if you're uh, very dictatorial, very demanding, and, and very harsh with people. It is effective. Uh, people will do exactly the minimum and nothing else. And don't ever depend on a, I, I watched this too, that people were ref, afraid to convey bad news uh, to the director because they didn't want to incur, they were afraid of incurring his wrath. And you know, he'd, you know, he'd fire people on the spot. Um, so then the next director came in, Admiral Geiler left, and General Phillips came in, and he was the exact opposite, the antithesis, 180 degrees out. Very quiet, very introverted, very courteous with everyone, very gracious. And the impact was amazing to see the difference in the way people reacted to that. Uh, people would bring ideas to him. People were not afraid to tell him, hey, this is screwed up and you need to do something about it. They, they weren't reluctant to do that. Now, both styles of leadership are, are effective. They both work. So fast forward 20 years. And now I'm a three-star general, and I'm now a director of an intelligence agency, in this case DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency. And so what I try to do is remember that experience, 
you know, both positive and, and negative. And yeah, there are times when you do have to be tough with people. But by and large, what I found in my 50 plus years in the Intel business is people want to do the right thing. They want to do the mission, they want to do it. They want to do it well, they want to excel in it. And you just have to create an environment where that can happen. Leadership and intelligence, ultimately, penultimately, I guess, is about motivating others to use their intellects. And that's, what's a, one, that's one of the great things from a diversity standpoint about the intelligence community. It's all about your brain. It doesn't matter what your ethnic group is, your gender, your sexual preference, none of that matters. It's your mind is what counts uh, in the intelligence community. And the, the interesting work that uh, you have the opportunity to, to, to engage in. Anyway, I sort of consider that kind of a, a leadership laboratory. It'll be in the book. <laughs> so, but I thought I'd mention it because uh, uh, in the context of, of leadership. I, looking back, I think the one factor that has changed the intelligence community, the thing that has changed the intelligence community more than anything else, looking back historically, is technology. It's not, uh, I mean, you know, when, when we had traumas like 9-11, yes, that had an impact. Uh, reorganizations, which I think are highly overrated, uh, yeah, but what has really historically changed the business of intelligence is, is technology. And I say that in the context of adversary technology, what, what, are, what are the adversaries doing, and our own, to cope with it. So just fast forward again on the most recent period, the six and a half years I spent as uh, Director of National Intelligence, my focus was on integration of the community. And that was the, the central message from the 9-11 Commission, which was convened, which Chris uh, served on, uh, was convened to examine what happened and what went wrong uh, in the 9-11 attacks. And so one of the major recommendations that came out of the commission was uh, their view that the nation needed a director of national intelligence. First, they called it the NID, you know, the National Intelligence Director. The acronyms aren't very appealing. The, the NID? No, no. <laughs> anyway, it came out DNI. And the notion was to have a, someone as, as a full-time responsibility uh, to champion uh, integration across the community. U.S. intelligence community is, you know, the premier capability on the planet. It's huge in total, uh, 70 billion plus this year, 76 billion I think it is, if you count DOD and the National Intelligence Program. Uh, that is larger than all but maybe three of the cabinet departments, three or four of them, as a, as a programmatic aggregation. So it's huge. So it's a, a, a major enterprise uh, to run. Sixteen components, uh, you know, six agencies, including now the FBI, which is very much a part of the U.S. intelligence community. So how to integrate that? How to, how to draw on the strengths, the complementary strengths of each of the agencies. And, and so that's what I worked on uh, during the six and a half years I was there. This, this is a, you know, it's a never ending journey. You know, you're not all done with integrating by close of business Friday. I think uh, the, the high, the low, and the most interesting, and we can talk about it during the Q&A, I think the high for me was uh, being present in uh, the White House Situation Room during the uh, raid to take down Osama bin Laden. That was an amazing, uh, amazing event. The low, I think, has to be, although lots of people don't agree with me about this, was uh, uh, Edward Snowden and the damage that uh, he continues to have caused. Um, we talk about that as well. Uh, I understand the issues with domestic surveillance, and if that's all he had exposed, I could probably be a lot more forgiving. But he exposed so much else and did so much damage that had absolutely nothing to do with uh, domestic surveillance. The most interesting experience for me, I think, was my trip to uh, North Vietnam, or, uh, North, excuse me, Freudian slip, North Korea, <laughs> in uh, November of 2014. And I was uh, on a mission to bring out two of our 
our citizens who had been in, imprisoned in hard labor there was a fascinating experience, particularly for me since I had served 30 years previous in Korea as the uh, Director of Intelligence for U.S. Forces Korea. So I sort of became an am amateur student of the peninsula after that, so it was on my professional bucket list someday to go to uh, North Korea. Finally, let me, let me uh, conclude this, these remarks with sort of some philosophical observations, I'll call them. It maybe sounds a little pretentious. Um, first of all, uh, you know, why, why do we do intelligence? Why does any nation state do intelligence? Well, the simple answer is uh, to reduce uncertainty. Reduce uncertainty for a policymaker, whether a policymaker is sitting in, in the Oval Office or if I can stretch the metaphor, oval foxhole. Doesn't make any difference. What you're trying to do is to, to reduce uncertainty and reduce the risk. Never eliminate it, not based on, rarely will you, will you based on intelligence, but you can certainly reduce it. And that was you know, Laura's metaphor about, uh, I used to use this a lot on the Hill when members uh, would like to beat me up about some policy they didn't like in the administration. And I use this metaphor more than one occasion. Well, I just said, Senator, I'm, uh, I'm just down in the engine room shoveling intelligence coal. People up on the bridge get to drive the ship, decide how fast it goes. They arrange all the deck chairs on the, on the decks and what direction the ship goes in. I don't do any of that. I'm just down here in the engine room shoveling intelligence coal. Anyway, reduce uncertainty. Why is it a great profession? Well, uh, I guess from that early uh, Philadelphia vignette with my grandparents, I just found it always uh, interesting uh, and an intellectual challenge. Not only for the work, not only for, um, uh, you know, what, what is the adversary doing and trying to figure out the adversary capabilities and intent, which is always very hard. Uh, and it, it, it never, I never got bored with it. Uh, I think that's, you know, I kind of stuck with it. I will tell you, I was, you know, as I mentioned I, briefly, I was out of the government for six years. Uh, money was great, but I just never got the psychic income I got from public service. And so when I was asked to come back in 2001, I jumped at it, although my wife was not too pleased at the time. <laughs> Another issue that often comes up is intelligence ethical. And of course, you know, the whole notion of spying, I don't even like that word, you know, the spies, or, I didn't, never liked, I was cringe when I was referred to as the head spy. There's always something sleazy about that, I don't know. But that's, you know, it's only three letters, so the media likes it. Um, I do think uh, it is uh, a noble calling. Um, and it all stems, I think, from uh, the values of this nation and what we have stood for. And there's lots of uh, bad people out there, bad nation states and bad non-nation states that don't agree with that and would want to attack it. So I think it is a noble thing to participate in keeping uh, this nation uh, safe and secure. Now, I may not be objective about it, but something was beat into me or instilled in me, I the better word, by my father. Um, uh, there is the issue of uh, something I wrestled with, uh, particularly the last 10 years uh, in the two jobs I had, was, uh, you know, safety and security on one hand and civilities and privacy on the other. You have to, you have to reconcile both. You have to do both at the same time. All is a challenge, and I will tell you frankly, after six and a half years of DNI, I get mixed, mis, mixed messages about that from the American public. Uh, in the post-Snowden environment, oh, too much government surveillance, too much big brother. Until we have an attack of some sort, well, then you should have been more invasive. And I saw that, that happen time after time after time, where the pendulum would swing back and forth. Boston Marathon is a case in point. We had three IGs do a post-event critique from Homeland Security, Department of Justice, and my IG. And the bottom line was that the FBI did everything it should have, abided by all the rules, 
but it should have been more invasive. And that's kind of the mixed messages that we get. I think there is, as citizens, there is a certain amount of uh, sacrifice for the common good. You know, it's why we all stop at stop signs most of the time and why we stop at red lights. It's really for the common good. I, I spoke about three or four years ago at a trade thing and after a particularly frustrating week of this, and I said, you know, we have a new paradigm in intelligence. And what the American public expects, the intelligence community, is to provide timely, accurate, relevant, and anticipatory intelligence all the time. Don't miss, no mistakes. But do that in such a way that there's no risk, and do it in such a way that if a foreign government finds out about it, they won't be mad. And do it in such a way that there isn't even the scintilla of a suggestion of jeopardy to anyone's civil liberties and privacy, ours and foreign citizens. We call that new paradigm immaculate collection. <laughs> now, I mean it semi-humorously, but it makes a point about the difficulty of being so precise, given the global interconnection represented by the internet, which is where everybody communicates, and the difficulty of sorting out you know, good people and bad people you know, hundreds and millions of people conducting billions and billions of innocent transactions, but among them are the bad people, nefarious people, doing bad things. And how do you, you know, isolate, and it isn't just one needle in one haystack, it's thousands of haystacks. And oh, by the way, if a straw of hay starts to convert into a needle, you better catch that. Now, I may be reflecting a little bit of my uh, bias is being, you know, from within. So, let me stop there. Uh, it's, I've probably gone over time here. Anyway, and uh, I think we're going to do, uh, hopefully do some Q's and A's. Otherwise, I'll, I'll just go home early, I guess, if you don't have any questions. <laughs> but Chris? Well, uh, sir, thank you so much, and I just want to um, reciprocate your very kind remarks by noting it was just a great honor uh, to serve you uh, and uh, serve in the position I held for five years, and uh, I've learned so much from uh, working uh, uh, with you and for you. Um, so let's turn uh, to um, questions here, and I just simply ask you to uh, stand and wait for the microphone uh, and uh, identify yourself and keep your question brief, please, so that we can have uh, as many questions as possible. So, uh, all right, um, see the first hand here. And uh, please wait for the microphone. Hello. Um, my name is Joseph. I'm a senior in the Elliott School. Put my hand up because I got that bright light there. I can't oh. see you very well. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, mine is, I guess, more of a policy question. How, uh, how successful do you think General Michael Flynn's efforts in Afghanistan to reorganize and rebolster the intelligence community's efforts there uh, helped the mission in Afghanistan, and do you think its effects are felt today and uh, it'll ultimately be successful? I didn't hear the question. It's about Afghanistan. Uh, the question uh, was with respect to General Flynn's report uh, about yeah. um, how to improve oh. intelligence uh, in Afghanistan right. and whether it's had lasting effects. Well, uh, I had quite a bit of discussion with Mike Flynn about that when he put it out. He was, uh, I was in the undersecretary in the Pentagon. And uh, first of all, uh, the basic thesis of that report was uh, kind of the Pogo syndrome. And we weighed the enemy and it's ourselves. And so what this uh, laid out was the need for great detailed fidelity about individual villages in Afghanistan, to understand the political dynamics, who the elders were, who the bad guys were and all that, and each individual village. Well, that is actually within the, uh, 
uh, domain of the resident intelligence officer there, who was, I think he was then Colonel Flynn. I don't know, if, I don't know what he was. Anyway, maybe he was a general. But the point was, what he was complaining about was under his own control. It's not feasible for uh, the national intelligence community to divine what's going on in Village X. Only if you're there on the ground. And he had a lot of intelligence resources. So, um, you know, we, certainly cultural, uh, I guess you'd call it cultural intelligence, understanding the, the broad dynamics of Afghanistan, understanding uh, particularly the, the tribal nature of, of Afghanistan. Those are very important things. But you get, when you get down to the level of detail that he was asking for, uh, I think it was, it was kind of on him uh, to attend to that. So I don't know that uh, it had some profound impact on uh, what, certainly what was going on in, in, uh, uh, back in, in, in the United States, if, that, if that's your question. All right. Um, we'll try um, over on this side, all the way uh, toward the aisle there. That, no, that's you. Yeah, please, go ahead. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Evan. Thank you so much for coming and talking to us today. Uh, you talked a lot about how people have sort of a weird double standard for collecting intelligence, and I wanted to ask more so about when people are collecting intelligence and putting themselves at risk. How do you evaluate the cost of an intelligence collecting mission when you don't know exactly what you're going to find? Well, that's a great question, and uh, it's, that's the sort of thing uh, we get asked every year, or I did, every year by the Congress. You know, we spend all this money on, intel on intelligence, or this, this particular intelligence system, whether it's an overhead collector or a number of humaners and all that. And how, how, do you, how do you evaluate the worth of it? And th this is a, a time-honored uh, challenge in intelligence. How much is a pound of intelligence worth? Well, the answer is it depends. And one of the difficulties of uh, uh, answering that question today is that there's a temporal aspect of intelligence. So intel a piece of intelligence collected today will have a, could have a different value next week, next month, or, or next year, or five years from now. This is particularly true in the imagery business, which has is great importance for history. And so it, it, uh, and we, we have all kinds of, of systems for evaluating uh, the performance of intelligence systems, but they are largely quanti quantitative. You know, this, this system produced this number of reports. And in the case of uh, the most subjective form of intelligence probably is, well, open source, but human, human classically, historically, is human intelligence. Always difficult to, to grade it. And sometimes, you know, you, you get a gem there. And other times, you know, the source turns out to be worthless. And I, so when the uh, uh, dimension of risk versus gain plays in your mind big time, of course, are with human collectors, many of whom take great risk to recruit an asset and, and uh, collect the intelligence. And th this is uh, extremely risky in a place like Russia or China, uh, you know, a denied, highly surveilled country. So it's a great question. I'm not sure I have a, uh, a glib answer for you because, uh, as I say, it depends. Okay, um, let's uh, get a question from the back on the right side here, please. Thank you. Um, Hi, my name is Jake. Um, so you said earlier that um, technology is a predominant driver in um, a driver of change in the um, intelligence community. To what extent is social media te technology and social media intelligence a driving force in um, in how um, the intelligence community appro approaches gathering um, open source intelligence? Well. I, if I, I think I understood the essence of the question was how does technology play in the open source context? Is that uh, and that in right? particular social media as um, okay. a driver of intelligence uh, collection and analysis? Well, it's uh, it's huge. Um, yeah, you know that was when the Russians m moved into Ukraine. 
that was a crucial piece of source of intelligence for us. You know, all soldiers are alike. They got to take pictures and send them home to mom and their girlfriends. Well, the Russian soldiers are the same way. And if they stand in front of things, you know, we, we get intelligence for that. So it, it's hugely important. And of course, that's a recent phenomenon. And in, in, in my day, you didn't have, you didn't, we didn't know what the term meant, social media. So it's hugely important. And, and uh, this is one case where uh, we absolutely must apply some automation uh, in order to, um, and, and we are, we've uh, made steady investments uh, in social media as a subset of what we call open source, uh, that which is available openly. And so it is a growing, uh, a growing importance of, of exploiting uh, social media. Uh, you know, we got into this a, a bit, not in, as in-depth as it is now, but the use of our own social media as a part of the Russian campaign to interfere with our election. So it's, it's very important uh, that we understand uh, what is going on in the uh, social media world. Okay, I've called on three men in a row, and it's time to change it up. Yeah, it's a diverse crowd here. So. Uh, please. Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm a freshman at the Elliott School, and I was wondering if you saw any correlation between the intelligence work that you did in the military versus the intelligence work that you did versus like in the government? Uh, actually not. Uh, and the question was, you know, was there, is there much difference between what I did uh, when I was in the military for 32 years in intelligence versus uh, the 16 years I was as a civilian? I, really not. The basic principles are the same and understanding the intelligence process is the same. Uh, obviously when I was in the Department of Defense, when I was director of DIA, folks focused much more on military uh, topics, but uh, in, in general, uh, no, there wasn't uh, not, not, not much difference. The customers are different, but, but the, the intelligence process and all that not, is not. Okay, over here, uh, please, uh, yes, sir, yeah, you. Good evening, sir. Um, my name is Henry, and I'm a sophomore here in the Elliott School. Uh, my question is regarding on the uncertainty you have previously mentioned. Um, one of the biggest uncertainty right now in international affairs is North Korea. The lack of information led to many miscalculations and misestimation in North Korean issue, especially on new North Korea's nuclear weapon plan. So my question is, in your opinion, what else should the United States intelligence system do in order to clear, in order to collect more and more precise information in North Korea? Thank you very much. Well, one thing would help is if we were there. Uh, yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's actually a serious uh, comment. Um, uh, when I uh, visited there in, in 14, uh, I, I've been an advocate of this before, is that I believe we should establish uh, an interest section in Pyongyang, uh, much as we had in, in Havana for decades to engage with a government we didn't recognize. Um, and I think we need to do the, uh, the same thing with the, North, with the DPRK, and there's several reasons for that. This is not a reward for bad behavior, by the way. This is uh, uh, pr very pragmatic. One is to have an in-residence uh, diplomatic presence in Pyongyang. Not an embassy, you know. We didn't have an embassy in Havana. And I have to think that there might have been a chance that things might have turned out differently for Otto Wambier, uh, the UVA student. Had there been a U.S. presence there uh, to bug the North Koreans with what, you know, and uh, demand access to them, those kind of things, and we weren't there to do that. I, I can't, obviously can't make that case, but I, I, I thought about that. That was a tragic thing that happened to that poor young man. Secondly, of course, uh, and I can't go into the detail here, but uh, it would certainly, uh, uh, should I put it euphemistically, it would enhance our understanding of North Korea if we were there. I'll just let it go at that. 
And maybe most important of all is a conduit for getting information into uh, North Korea. Um, I don't find, uh, for, and I guess while I'm on the subject of North Korea, I shouldn't ask me that question. I'd go on for days about it, but um, the notion of demanding uh, denuclearization as a condition for negotiation is crazy. They are not. It's a great ideal. I mean, I'd love nothing better for the North Koreans to say, okay, we're all done with nuclear weapons. But that isn't going to happen. And as I learned when I was there, they go to school on what happens in the rest of the world. And so they watched Muammar Gaddafi in Libya, and he negotiated away his weapons of mass destruction, and it didn't turn out so well for him. And the North Koreans understand very well that if they don't have nuclear weapons or the optic of having nuclear weapons, it doesn't matter if they work, they have created what they want, which is deterrence and attention. They crave the attention. And so when Ambassador Haley says they are uh, begging for war, no, they're not begging for war, they're begging for attention. They want the recognition. They want to be included as that tenth nuclear country. And, and all that that uh, demands. So as far as denuclearizing that train, I'm afraid, left the station a long time ago. I don't believe their, I believe their demand to, to negotiate a peace treaty is not unreasonable. All we have there right now is an armistice. They stopped shooting on the 27th of July, 1953. So if you're sitting in Pyongyang looking south, you see a very, very formidable, overwhelming conventional military force in the form of the of Republic of Korea Armed Forces. Modern, well-trained, well-equipped, <laughs> much better fed, buttressed by the United States. So they see no way to match that conventionally. Ergo, uh, you know, for them, their nuclear weapons, is, there, is that's their life insurance. That's their ticket to survival. So they're not going to give them up. And we just, I think, have to recognize that and try to negotiate with them. Uh, and I think the the, the, quid, the quid here, the quid pro quo would be is they need to stop testing underground and uh, stop the missile shots. Of course, we all look to China because, uh, yes, China has the most economic leverage over North Korea, no question about it. And I can attest, I, I, I was in China uh, a year ago, June, and had a long session, a long series of meetings with uh, Secretary Meng, who is the uh, Politburo member that oversees all of their intelligence and uh, security organizations. And yes, the, North Korea, the Chinese do not like Kim Jong-un. They don't like his behavior. They don't like the underground tests. They don't like the missile tests. They don't like the THAAD deployment. But what they don't like even more is the thought of North Korea violently imploding and the loss of what is a strategic imperative for them, which is a buffer state in the form of the DPRK. So they'll all put the screws on the North Koreans. They, they will, but only to a point. OK, let's mix it up here. Yes, please, on the aisle. Hi, my name is Aditi Patil. I'm a student here at the Elliott School. I'm just wondering to what extent, um, in your opinion, does the private tech sector in America have a responsibility for the negative transactions that are occurring on their platforms, or at least to collaborate with US government intelligence and law enforcement? Can you help me here, Chris? Yeah, so the question is with respect to uh, what is the responsibility of the high-tech private sector to cooperate with uh, the government? law enforcement and intelligence? Excellent question. Um, that's, that's been an issue. It certainly was for us. And of course, one of the, in the aftermath of uh, uh, the Edward Snowden uh, revelations was a chilling of, uh, I'll put it that way, of, of the, the historical partnership between industry and, uh, and the intelligence community. And some of that you know, is, is, is understandable. This is another case, though, where uh, we, it's, it's like the safety and security, civilities and privacy. There has to be a, a balance somewhere. 
Uh, I hear, you know, I understand uh, Tim Cook, uh, head of Apple, and who takes a very uh, absolutist uh, view. What happened after uh, the revelations of Edward Snowden that the rate of uh, commercial encryption uh, accelerated by about seven years. In other words, what we thought we were going to see in 2020, we saw immediately. And of course, the terrorists, particularly, regrettably, went to school on a lot of this and, and of course bought into you know, WhatsApp and other uh, secure applications which you know, we can't break. So I think there needs to be a serious discussion, serious thought given to how much of a pass are you comfortable, as, as the American public comfortable, with giving to the likes of child pornographers, terrorists, human traffickers, murderers, et cetera, who can use uh, secure communications. We lost uh, a lot of capability to track terrorist plots overseas uh, because of, of that. And so we're not there, we're in a bad place. Uh, what we had decided, we, the last administration, was that we were going to pick uh, within the intelligence community, have Director Jim Comey, who was we thought would be staying on, and that he would be the lead uh, spokesman for the government's cause, because he was a great public speaker. And we thought the most compelling arguments here for having some sort of modus vivendi, if you will, with industry would be the law enforcement argument, which is probably, in the minds of many people, more compelling than uh, national security. Well, Director Comey's gone. Uh, unfortunately. So I don't know where we're at there, but I just, I, uh, I do, I just wish that the, the, uh, the energy, the innovative, innovativeness, the creativity uh, of, of the industry would be brought to bear on this problem. How can we do both? Guarantee people, you know, guarantee people's, people's privacy. Uh, I, I like my privacy too, by the way. Uh, you know, I'm, just because I was a head spy, that's important to me too. Uh, but I, 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 do, I think we're, we're uh, out of balance uh, right now. I will tell you this is a huge issue overseas, um, with, particularly in the Commonwealth countries, uh, who come here regularly and go to Silicon Valley and appeal to them for help. And of course, you know, the United States is, is still dominant in, in this whole business. Uh, most of the, in, you know, internet infrastructure in the world is either owned or controlled or influenced by the United States. I, I, I get all the counter arguments uh, to this. I, I really do. But there, there's, there's got to be a better way. Okay. Um, we'll go all the way in the back. I can't see you, but I want to give... I apologize to you. Uh, one of the uh, legacies of a long time in the Air Force is uh, bad on my ears. <laughs> so I, I don't hear so well. That's why I got to Chris translate for me. Uh, Hi, my name is Elizabeth. Uh, and please, um, stand please stand up so we can see you and hear you. Yes, I am. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> you, you just can't I see. I might be in the, the light. light. I lost you in the light. The light, yeah. My name is Elizabeth and I am a graduate student here at the Elliott School and thank you so much for your service in the intelligence community. My question is, in, in light of being a past DNI, what for the next generation of intelligence officers, in addition to mentoring, do you, would you provide advice on going into the field today? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, well, one thing I would tell you, and forgive the commercial, is if you are interested in, in uh, working in the intelligence community, is if you have any opportunity for an internship, and most all the agencies particularly offer internships to college students, well, I would look into that and I would apply to every one of them. Too many people, young people, say, oh, I want to go to CIA because it's cool. Well, yeah, it's cool, but there's lots of great work and many, many challenges in all the other agencies. And the main thing you want to think about is just getting on with one of them. Because there is mobility, once you, you can move around once you get there. But the big thing is to get on, get your clearance, uh, which these days is getting harder and harder. 
Now, the reason I, I tell you that is because you don't have to necessarily go to the government. You can also serve as a contractor, working for the government. And that clearance you get, and particularly if you, and if you intern someplace, you go to NSA or one of the agencies and intern, that will carry over with you. And that, that will mean more, just to be crass about it, it means more money for you if you will go to work as a contractor. So apply to everything. Uh, just get on uh, someplace, and the, uh, the second piece of advice is be patient. Uh, the, one of the difficulties we're running into because of our, our, di our problems with uh, clearances is uh, people have to wait a long time. Well, if you're graduating from college and you've got a student loan to pay off, and if you're married and have obligations like that, you can't wait around. And that, that's, a, that's on us, that's a, or not me anymore, but a problem for uh, the intelligence community. You know, I'm going through an interesting experience right now because uh, my grandson, <laughs> this really makes me feel old, uh, is an IT contractor at CIA. He's uh, about a 53 year age difference. And uh, we had a lot of interesting conversations about how he approached it. He's 23, 24. Uh, and we have a lot of interesting discussions about life in the intelligence community and how he approaches things uh, when he is, you know, starting out in his career versus when I started uh, 50 plus years ago. And there aren't actually a lot of differences. I mean, he's patriotic, he's committed, mission focused, all that. But he's a millennial, needs lots of feedback, you know. Um, <laughs> And the one thing that we need to be able to do and the intelligence, the intelligence community needs to do, I believe, is promote mobility. In other words, come in and serve somewhere in the intelligence community and then go to industry for a while and then come back. And we, we need to be able to facilitate that so it's not a huge uh, gauntlet you have to run from a clearance standpoint. And both you and the government will be better for it. Uh, if, if we can promote more, uh, more mobility. Okay, uh, please, all the way over on the aisle, the gentleman with the glasses. Hi, my name is Luke Madura, and I'm a student at the Elliott School. Um, I just wanted to ask you, given um, the past interference in our election, do you think the nature of, of domestic intelligence, I'm sorry, of the, of domestic intelligence a gathering, do you think that's, how can you speculate that's gonna change? Well, uh, the way we're organized, and this is a, a, a direct outgrowth of 9-11 uh, of and the changes in the intelligence community that ensued after that. And, and one of the big changes was uh, the FBI became, becoming part of uh, the intelligence community. So there are thousands of billets in the FBI that are, that are actually funded by intelligence. And the, the FBI occupies a unique position because it straddles both the law enforcement arena as well as intelligence. And, and uh, so my general counsel used to wash my mouth out with soap when I even used the term domestic intelligence. Because that's a very charged term in this country. Um, but we sort of looked to the FBI, and now uh, with the other uh, very important organization in all this is the Department of Homeland Security. So in the run-up to the election, when we saw what was going on, as more time went by, we understood better what the Russians were doing. Uh, the, the prime uh, interlocutors with the domestic side, meaning uh, the voting apparatus, which of course is managed at the state and local level. The federal government doesn't manage uh, the voting apparatus, if I can call it that, uh, throughout this country. So the natural interface was a combination of the FBI, <laughs> Director Comey and his people, and uh, Jay Johnson, who was then the uh, Secretary of Homeland Security, who interacted with uh, uh, election commissions, secretaries of state, whoever uh, in each state was in charge. And you know, um, this is a, a, a profound threat to this country, is the Russian interfering in our political process. Uh, they were wildly successful with relatively modest um, uh, in investment of resources. They had huge success. 
their first objective was to sow discord and discontent in this country, and they succeeded to it fairly well. Secondarily, uh, great personal animus by uh, President Putin towards Hillary Clinton. And then as things unfolded, well, you know, Mr. Trump would be a better for them. And so they, they tried to help him win. And uh, regardless of what he says, the evidence for this, which we couldn't expose for understandable reasons, was overwhelming. And that's why we had such a high confidence level when we put out our intelligence community assessment on the, on the 6th of January. I say we, I'm speaking of NSA, CIA, FBI, and my office. A very high confidence about it. And this is what the American public needs to be concerned about because this is going to continue. And the Russians don't care, by the way. Next time, they'll stick it to the Republicans. They, they don't care. And we as a people ought to really be alarmed about this. And I, I worry that all the, you know, the investigations and whether there collusion or not, you know, that, that'll pan out. What worries me the most as a former DNI and now as a citizen is, is what the Russians, the, the success they've enjoyed. And they're going to continue it. And we as a people need to be alert to that. Okay. Uh, uh, over here, uh, yes, uh, please. Yes, uh, ma'am. Yeah. Hello, I'm Madeline, and I'm a junior here at the Elliott School. Uh, my question is, what, do you, what are the consequences do you foresee uh, arising from the Kurdish independence push, or even more broadly, U.S. support of various Kurdish groups in the region, specifically on our relationships with uh, Turkey and Iraq? Help me here, Chris. Uh, the question is about uh, U.S. support for Turkish groups and what are the ramifications of that, particularly with uh, U.S. Uh, relations with Iraq and, and Turkey, I think you said. Uh, are you speaking of the Kur question. Kurdish question? Kurds, yeah, yes. the Kurds. Well, that's, uh, that's been a very, uh, very tricky course, uh, at least it was when I was uh, in the government. Um, because, you know, the Kurds were our... Uh, uh, you know, great fighters. Uh, they're also interested in pursuing uh, their own independence. And of course, we had uh, a very difficult uh, line to walk by, you know, we wanted to uh, maintain good relations with uh, President Erdogan. Uh, and of course, from his vantage, uh, you know, the organization, uh, uh, every Kurd was somehow connected with the PKK which of course for them is a, is a terrorist group. And the Turks, the Turkish government worries a lot more about the PKK than they do ISIS. So we didn't have exactly a, a confluence of, of a consistency of views there. So it was a very delicate balance uh, to engage with the Kurds who are great fighters, resistant to the uh, ISIS, but in doing so not incur uh, the wrath of the Turkish government. And so they're, I don't have a good answer for you. I just know that a, a very difficult line to navigate. Okay, over to uh, this side, uh, sir. Yeah, you. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Director Clapper, you know, again, thank you for uh, coming uh, over here to GW. Uh, my question is about North Korea. Um, because I'm sure it was like a highlight of your career. Um, ironically, it happened to be a highlight of uh, my career. Uh, so when you were going on your way to North Korea, you stopped through Travis Air Force Base. Um, I know that because at the time I was Staff Sergeant Koble um, working in the protocol office at Travis Air Force Base. So that I got was, to- uh, Actually, it was McCord. On the way back. But yeah. on the way there, I believe, um, you did stop through. I think it was a McCord. <laughs> yeah, on the uh, McCord was on the way back, yeah, but uh, you actually refueled at uh, Travis um, on the way there, and your oh. staff came in. Um, got to talk to them, and they said, oh, yeah, James Clapper's on board, and of course, I'm a huge nerd, so I was very excited. Um, you didn't get off the plane, but it's, it's fine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but no, uh, it's a uh, question, please. Well, very reason, proud to get to meet you now, though. For that. Uh, very proud to get to meet you now, though. But the question was, uh, what was that process like uh, working with the DPRK, and what did you, or what, what was something you learned and, and took away from that? Well, 
uh, everything you read about how uh, what a bizarre place North Korea is, uh, it's all true. Uh, it is really a bizarre place. Um, well, in terms of what I learned there was uh, the uh, what blew me away, frankly, was the siege mentality and the paranoia that prevails uh, in North Korea among the leadership there. Uh, I, I wasn't prepared for that. And everywhere they look, they see, uh, they see enemies. And so that's why this sort of bellicose uh, rhetoric right now is, is not good. Um, and so I've been, I've been extrapolating my experience when I was there three years ago to what's going on now. And, you know, the President of the United States has advisors around him uh, who can tell him, you know, what the implications are. Kim Jong-un doesn't have any advisors. He has a bunch of psychophants that are all yes-men. And it, you, you, you'll see these pictures of Kim Jong-un. You've got these g generals, you know, bedecked with all these medals. And they all got their little notebooks out, dutifully writing down everything he says. And, the, you know, the price for pushing back in North Korea is kind of high. You know, you, you push back with him, you get executed, which is a very effective management technique, I might mention. <laughs> so what I worry about is, is there's one guy there, Kim Jong-un, and I, I have no idea, nor does anybody else, you know, what is it that's going to light his fuse? And I would much prefer what uh, Secretary Mattis did about six missile tests ago, where he simply said, we know that the North Koreans have test, tested a missile, we have no further comment, which would drive the North Koreans crazy. Because what they crave, again, is that attention. And Kim Jong-un is just eating this up, having this direct dialogue with the President of the United States. When I went there, I had a very pro forma letter from President Obama to give to, give to them to give to Kim Jong-un. Didn't say anything, just say, you know, I was, uh, I was appointed as his uh, envoy. It would be a very positive gesture if the DPRK government would release our two citizens. That's all it said. They, they really wanted that letter. Just the fact that the President of the United States addressed the letter to the head of uh, the DPRK. That was a huge deal to them. And that, by the way, was the only leverage I had, or that I felt I had. And when I gave that letter away, I was really nervous. I had, I had no guarantee I was going to get. And the main mission, my main mission, was to get those two people out. Incidentally, I, I never heard from either one of the, the two for until I was in Seoul on the 26th of June. And I was interviewed by a Korean newspaper. And this uh, interviewer uh, from the paper said, she had a message from Kenneth Bay, who was one of the two uh, citizens who was a missionary in, uh, in North Korea, was trying, you know, trying to do good, and he got arrested for it. And he'd been in, he, when we got him out, he had been in hard labor for two years. Uh, and he was actually in very good shape. Anyway, he sent me a wonderful message uh, uh, expressing his appreciation for you know, getting him out and all that sort of thing. And I will tell you, when uh, I watched the family reunions, it was uh, very impactful. I went to the cockpit and watched, and uh, um, quite heartrending to see, the, you know, see them reunited with their families. It was great. Okay, yes, a question here, ma'am. Hello, my name is Manoush, and I'm a freshman at the Elliott School. Um, my question is regarding cybersecurity and the Internet of Things. Um, you briefly mentioned this in your speech, but you've previously talked about how cyber attacks are the number one threat facing our country. Um, and with the number of Internet of Things devices that collect personal information increasing exponentially, what do you think firms can and should do to better arm themselves against the cyber threat? Well. Uh, this is a, a never-ending thing. Uh, we will never n achieve uh, cyber nirvana, cyber security nirvana. And the reason is because the internet, when it was created, uh, the founding fathers didn't think about security. So it is fundamentally flawed. 
if you have, if you're connected to the internet, it's, there's an inherent vulnerability, and we just have to understand that. Um, I remember when I was, uh, I, I think, both from an institutional and a personal level, uh, you know, doing the simple things uh, of hygiene. Um, one of the things that we did in, uh, in, after you left, Chris, was uh, training our employees on uh, fishing, spear fishing, and to, to be able to recognize you know, bad emails and don't open attachments. And the only way I could get that, you know, to improve was we do tests once a month and we keep scores of each office. And then I'd throw the scores up at the weekly staff meeting. Well, nobody wants to be embarrassed and that got all the leaders' attention and they started paying attention to this. So things like, simple things like that and be religious about patches. You know, change passwords and, you know, password one, two, three, four, doesn't work. And it's, it's the simple things that get us in trouble. And a lot of these, these massive breaches, the OPM breach and all these other things, were caused by a failure to just abide by uh, simple hygiene. And it's something you have to do both as a, as a you know, personally and then uh, individually. What's really frustrating, you know, like the Equifax breach, where an organization you're, you're counting on to protect all your personal data, and they don't. And that is, you know, that's really egregious. Institutionally, what I saw, uh, particularly when I served in the Pentagon, and we were engaging with industry, this is in the uh, early 2000s, and we get, you know, the CEOs in from these companies, and when they would, when you could show them a threat, and oh, by the way, this is this could affect your bottom line, that always got their attention, and then they would apply uh, the necessary. And 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 reason is, of course, that, that when you do, it costs money uh, to keep your uh, your net your network secure. It it it, it costs money. Um, so. There's no uh, silver bullet here. I will tell you that it's almost a waste of time to talk about computer network attack if, in fact, we can't guarantee that we, that we can withstand a counter-retaliation. Um, so fundamentally, uh, we must attend to defense first. And, and arguing about you know what our cyber policy is on attacking and all doesn't matter, because unless we have confidence in our ability to uh, withstand a counterattack, we shouldn't bother. And the problem is we think th we think very legalistically and precisely and surgically. And the adversary you can't you can't count on adversaries to do that. So if we counterattack, you have to anticipate a greater disproportionately greater kind of retaliation. And unless you're sure you can withstand it, don't bother. Okay, um, uh, back on the aisle, the gentleman. Uh, hi, <clears throat> my name is Michael. I'm a uh, second year uh, master's student here. I wanna thank you both for your uh, countless years of service. Um, my question is fairly simple, but also sort of complex. Uh, how do we go about restoring faith and trust in public institutions, um, particularly when the intelligence community is such a d disadvantage in that uh, its failures are known, but its successes are unknown? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And uh, um, I think it came across to me uh, uh, after uh, Snowden because one of the you know one of the lessons you had to take away from that is the intelligence community, which is inherently a secret institution, it works with secrets, um, has to figure out ways to be more transparent. So one of the things we did was uh, start declassifying FISA court judgments, FISA court decisions. Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act courts. It's a unique institution, unlike any other, no other country in the world has that institution. 
And this is a rotation of uh, district uh, federal judges who sit as, as a body for two weeks and then they rotate in and out uh, to uh, address FISA applications. It needs, there needs to be a better understanding of how that, how that works. It needs to be a better understanding of all the safeguards that are built into overseeing what the intelligence community does. Start, you know, all three branches of the government oversee the intelligence community. So the combination of uh, you know, declassifying as much as we possibly can. Now, when you do that, transparency has a, has a double-edged sword because the adversaries go to school on that very transparency. So there's always a risk gain judgment you make. What actually are we gonna damage here if we expose this to the public? And I, I felt, for exactly the reason you, you, you infer, that in order to uh, regain uh, the faith, trust, and confidence of the American people and their elected representative, we're gonna have to be more transparent about what we did. The most controversial thing that uh, Edward Snowden exposed was uh, the, business, the limited business records telephony metadata that NSA stored from three providers. And that was an, a judge to be when it was established a deep dark secret. We're not gonna tell anybody about it. And I'm convinced, and this is in the, you know, this is in the uh, aftermath of 9-11, of, of where we didn't have a mechanism if you had a foreign caller calling someone in, in the United States. Well, it'd be interesting to know if this foreign caller is involved in a, a terrorist plot and he's talking to somebody in the United States or somebody's in the United States, it'd be good to know about it, to thwart a plot, which we didn't do with 9-11. So that was the whole reason for having it. But I'm convinced that I, I don't think there have been any more anxiety about it than there is about the fact that the FBI maintains hundreds of millions of fingerprint files on innocent Americans. But everybody knows they do it, they know the purpose for it, and, uh, and, and it's, it's open, it's, it's known. And so that's what we should have done with the 215 program. And I think it had more to do with, with well, two things, the, the shock of the, of the manner in which it was revealed, and then of course the media uh, narrative that developed, which try as we might, we could not counter. Okay, this uh, I think will be our last question. Uh, Ma'am on the aisle. Yeah, I'm gonna roll. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's okay, I'm old enough for that. Um, so my question is partially North Korea focused as well. Um, that's my background. My name is Freedom. I am a first year master's student in international policy and law and a Navy veteran. With the tool set that we currently have, um, well, I'll put a tool set, with the mindset we currently have in this administration, and the way he wants to renegotiate or relook at the Iraq um, nuclear arms agreement. Iran. Iran, yeah. sorry, sorry, Iran, sorry. Um, what tool set do you think would be helpful for this administration when negotiating with North Korea for something similar because I'm on the same page with you. And then the second part is he put a travel ban on North Koreans. And the concern I have with this is most North Koreans that do leave North Korea are refugees, <laughs> of whom I work with a lot of. I'm sorry, so are what? refugees. Refugees, oh, with refugees yeah, from North, North Korea. Works. So the travel ban for them is something a little bit more um, uh, it's, it's definitely more impacting a direct sector of the North Korean population. So those are my two questions. Well, well first, thanks for, your, thanks for your service. Uh, second, um, I do think it's, it's instructive to uh, look at Iran and North Korea right now. And what it, I think one thing it illustrates is it's much easier to negotiate with a country that doesn't have a nuclear weapon to prevent it from getting one than it is to negotiate with a country that already has one or is gonna get one. And that's why I would be an advocate for just acknowledging the fact that, we, that the North Koreans are not going to negotiate away, at least not immediately, maybe someday in Nirvana land, uh, but they're not immediately gonna n negotiate away their nuclear weapons, they're just not. Because they know that they, they've lost their, whatever leverage they had. So if the administration uh, decides to decertify 
the JCPOA, the Joint uh, Comprehensive Plan of Action with Iran. I just hope they have a plan B. Uh, because the Iranians are, are complying with it. Now, they get at, they, you know, they get, the Iranians get critiqued because they're not complying with the spirit, whatever that means, uh, of the agreement. Um, yes, there are ambiguities in, in the agreement. There's no question about it, and the, and the Iranians will probably take advantage of it. But just remember, they have shipped out of their country 25,000 pounds of highly rich uranium. They've cemented their uh, water, heavy water production facility at Iraq, which is what you need for plutonium. Uh, they've mothballed many hundreds of their centrifuges, and an unprecedented uh, intrusive surveillance regime that's maintained by the IAEA, you know, the International Atomic Energy uh, Agency. So I think, I just hope it gives some serious thought to giving that up because we will never put Humpty Dumpty together again and reform the international coalition that imposed sanctions on Iran, which is what brought them to the table in the first place. That, that'll never happen. By the way, there are five other countries involved in this agreement besides us. It's a P5 plus one. So the permanent members of the, United, uh, the UN Security Council, you know, Russia, China, UK, France, and us, plus Germany. And they're not interested in pitching out of that agreement. And you know, I fail to see, I fail to understand how pitching out of this agreement is going to make Israel safer, for example. So for me, it was a very s simple proposition. Which would you rather have, a state-sponsored terrorism with a nuclear weapon capability or a state-sponsored terrorism without a nuclear weapons capability? And for me, I, I sort of picked the latter, because that's what we got right now. The, the agreement was not designed to cure world hunger and make Iran the shining city on the hill. That was never the point. And had we tried to negotiate some comprehensive, you know, feel-good thing and end all of Iran's nefarious beha behavior in the region, it never got anywhere. So we took away, the last administration did, and I was just the intel guy, Shelvin Cole, so I wasn't involved in the policy on this. So I'm just speaking now as a private citizen. And I also uh, wonder uh, the, pre the focus on whether or not Iran is agreeing with the spirit of the JCPOA while Russia is abjectly violating the INF Treaty, a treaty approved by the United States Senate. And you never hear about that. Sorry. <laughs> Well, uh, Director Clapper. Oh, let's see, what was the other question? Uh, oh, with respect to refugees yes. well, and the travel the, ban. Well, you know, the, I'll just put it this way. When uh, uh, cynical uh, interpretation of this latest travel ban is uh, we'll put a patina of uh, uh, non-Muslim uh, non states like, you know, certain officials in Venezuela and in North Korea. I think last year there were less than 10 North Koreans that came to the United States. So that, you know, that's kind of ceremonial. Most defectors, uh, in my day when I served there as a director of intelligence of the US Force of Korea, we, it was a big deal. We got two or three defectors out of North Korea. This is back in 85, 86, 87. Now they come by the hundreds. But they, most all of them want to gravitate to the South. There's lots of reasons for that. Uh, but there, there are strong family bonds still between the, uh, the North and, and the South. By the way, one vignette I just thought of, I, I might, if there's uh, any room for optimism here in North Korea, was uh, my principal, I had two interlocutors who were two four-star, right? one was a political four-star, Minister of State Security who <laughs> since been executed, and the other was the uh, chief of their uh, Reconnaissance General Bureau, which is the, their amalgam of special operations and intelligence. And they, he was my main host, a real knuckle dragger, a really nasty guy. And it was very <coughs> unpleasant. So when we, when we got our two guys out after in, we went through this bizarre amnesty granting ceremony in the Corio Hotel and got our two guys change of clothes and we were, we, wanted, we were booking, boy, we wanted to get to the airport and get out of there. So I had a uh, mid-level Minister of State Security 
uh, he'd be like a colonel or a GS-15, that level, who was in a vehicle, sort of my escort out to the airport. And we had the most temperate conversation. And uh, the reason I could make, the con I could make that contrast because I had exactly the same translator. This is weird, too. The translator is North Korean with a British accent. It was, it was <laughs> weird. But it was the same guy. He's very good English. And even his tone was more moderate. And so this guy asked me on the way out to Sunan, get on a plane and leave, said, uh, well, if you, it, you know, would you come back to North Korea? And I said, sure, if I was invited, I, I'd, I'd come back. And he went on to talk about what a shame it was that the country of, of Korea has been split for this long, what a tragedy it was for all Koreans. And you know, even their language is, is getting separate because the South Koreans have all these Western terms that have invaded their, the, the Korean language in the Republic, not so in the North. So even the language is getting dis, dis, disparate. And then he said, uh, he was a Minister of State Security guy, so he apparently had been to the South Korea, South Korea he'd been to Seoul, and uh, when they had, when, at times when the North and the South have met together. And I, he made what I thought was a very telling statement. He said, you know, I've been to Seoul, and I've seen what's there. I just thought that was for them. I mean, he's, you know, he's got his button on and all that sort of thing. Uh, but I thought that was a very telling comment. Speaking of the button, that's another important point to think about with Kim Jong-un. Kim Jong-un is not only the head of state, as his father, Kim Jong-il, and, and Kim Il-sung, the founder of the DPRK, they, they are also regarded as deities in the North. So when President Trump insults Kim Jong-un, well, it sounds cool, he's also insulting their god. And of course, they play all this in North Korea, to, to, d deliberately to incite the people. Because as I was reminded when I was there, Kim Jong-un is a deity. Well, Director Clapper, uh, certainly want to thank you for your 50 years of service and your visit to the Elliott School at the George Washington University today. And a small token of appreciation for you, a GW Sweatshirt. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I, I still want one of those. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nice.